Uh, let's see, so it is October 28th, 2006. We are sitting here at the South Dakota School of Mines and Technology. I am sitting, I'm Rob Campbell, and I'm sitting with Charlie and Nancy Knight, and we're going to talk about their involvement in the uh, T28 program. So if uh, you could just introduce yourselves first. Oh, I'm Nancy Knight. And I'm, Char I'm Charlie Knight, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> I don't know if that's so obvious. <laughs> So, uh, can you uh, tell me what your backgrounds are, uh, what your fields are in this whole endeavor? Cloud physics. And we both came from the University of Washington in Seattle to NCAR in 63, 2, 2, 62, April 62. We've been there ever since. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> my, my background was in geology, and then, and then I worked for the University of Washington uh, in their Arctic program. And got involved with ice, and got a job at the NCAR in 1962. Um, started out studying icy, icy things that are particularly relevant to the atmosphere, and of course that includes hail and snow. <laughs> we went to Japan for a couple of years, 1963 to 1965, and then came back, and it, shortly after we came back, they were starting, starting up the hail project of the National Hail Research Experiment. Got involved in that, and that's what brings us to the T28 because that was the T28 was one of the first big instruments that the National Hail Research Experiment kind of sponsored. So the time the T28 came around was the time that the National Hail Research Experiment was starting up. Yes, that's right. So they they sort of came in together. Yeah. So how did you happen to be pulled in? Well, what, I'll just ask this. What was your involvement with the T28 aspect of that program? Our involvement, um, I was involved a little bit through in, in the instrumentation. I, I, I remember at, at the time that the T28 was starting up and the National Hail Research Experiment was starting up, there was a class of new aircraft instruments that called the Nullenberg probes, named after their, their inventor, for measuring the hydrometeors in, in clouds from aircraft. And the, the T-28, I believe they had, is essentially the first version of the, of the 2D probe and of the FSSP. Uh, and as far as I know, they, they were they were perhaps purchased by the National Hail Research Experiment, but I'm, I'm not sure of that. Mm -hmm. uh, there was there was certainly a, a financial relationship there somehow, but I, I think exactly what it was, we don't we don't know. We weren't involved in the administration right. at all. Uh, we we were working on hail stones and, and in the National Hail Research Experiment. We we had a, a vehicle and we went out and we. We chased hailstorms and collected the hailstones and then cut up the hailstones and looked at their structures and tried to see how they fit into the theories of hail formation. Ah, so what did you look when you're looking at a hailstorm that's been hailstone that's been cut open? What do you look at? This has never occurred to me before. We look at its internal structure, which is which comprises two two parts. The the air bubbles that are included in the hail. The, the reason the reason the hail usually looks white is it's because of light scattering off of the air bubbles in the ice. Hmm. Um, and, and the air bubbles define a layering. People, people talk about about the layering of hailstones being something like tree rings, which, which is a, a, a it's a pretty misleading metaphor actually. But but the the layering, the, the, the air bubble structure and the crystal structure in the, in the hailstone growth layers does tell you something about the conditions where the hailstone grew and the, and this, this, the, the, the sequence of conditions. 
in the cloud where the, where the hailstones grew. <clears throat> so this is what you were doing in the 60s? Yes. Yes, 60s and early, early 70s. You must have been excited by this big new project, the NHRE. Yeah, we were excited in several ways. Nancy has lots of stories about that. <laughs> Oh, it's all right if I'm Well, I'm just going to say that the first experiences we had with the T-28 in Henry were that it would come down from South Dakota and land in the highway because the oil, what was it that failed? Well, you'll get the proper story out of this a lot of people, but my, my understanding was that, that, the, that the oil intake, uh, the intake to the oil pump in the, in the engine for an airplane that has to sometimes fly upside down, has to, has to be rather specially designed, otherwise gravity uh, makes it a problem for it to, for it to get the oil and, and, and lubricate the engine. I guess on this flight the, the plate was flying upside down and then the oil pump intake was not of this special kind and, it, and the engine lost its oil and, and fried itself. <laughs> but it was Wayne Sand who was the pilot at that time. Mm -hmm. And I remember at least that happening when he landed on the highway at least twice, maybe the first two flights. And then I think the problem got Result. So what were your roles in Henry? What chasing you, hail. Chasing hail. Catching hail and then looking at the hail in the laboratory back at Encor. So you kept chasing the hail when it was on the ground? Yeah. Yes. And you would chase the same hail that they were trying to measure up in the air? Is that the idea or were you just chasing hail in we general? We both chased together the first few years, and after that, uh, I chased it. He talked on the, he paid it more attention to the radar and the other operational parts. We would, we would hope to, to catch hail from the same storm that was being studied by the, by the T-28, but hail's rare enough and it's hard enough to, hard enough to, to get under a hail storm. Soon, soon, either during or soon after the hail has fallen, but you'd be pretty lucky, really, to, to be looking at the same storm. So, did you ever work with the uh, the data that came from the instruments on the T twenty eight? Yeah, I did. I did somewhat. Yes, especially very early. Mm -hmm. uh, pretty, pretty much in, in, in as, as, as I said, these these instruments, these Nolenberg probes. Were, were, were very new at the time. And Nolenberg is spelled K N O L L E M B E R G. <clears throat> and one of the questions was how well they worked. So, so I, I, did, I did work on the, on, the, on the very earliest data from, these, from that stuff from, from the T28. From the Since the T-28 was the only aircraft that could fly inside the hailstorms at, 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 at the time, that, that was the only data we had on things like the cloud droplet size distributions and the, and the uh, hail and snow and, and gravel size, size, size distributions in, in the storm. So can I ask you this? Uh, how is hail formed? Yeah, is there a short question. answer, or is that a? <laughs> yeah, there's a there's a short answer. <clears throat> hail hail forms by a piece of ice falling in a cloud of supercooled droplets, and it, and it runs into the supercooled water droplets, and when they touch the ice, they freeze and accumulate. Their 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 accumulation makes the hailstorm. And it has to be supercooled ice. Well, it has to be supercooled water, because otherwise it would just bump into other pieces of ice and would never form large enough hailstones to to notice? Well, it has to be super cooled water or, or it wouldn't freeze. Mm -hmm. um, Don't forget the embryo. Well, 
I'm not forgetting the embryo, but that wasn't the question. Oh yeah, <laughs> okay. The question, the question was the question was how was how ale forms. Right. Uh, ale, ale forms by the accretion of super cool water droplets. Super cool meaning water droplets, but well below the freezing point. Right. Uh, several people today have talked about the uh, Russian discoveries. This is the late 60s, early 70s yeah, kind of time. Big job zone. Yeah. Uh -huh. The Russians had it wrong, or the Russians had it partly wrong. But the Russians were talking about supercooled water also. Yeah, they, were, talk talk they were talking yeah, about supercooled raindrops. Big drops. Big, big drops, yeah. And in a special layer. Oh, I see. I, I was talking about supercooled cloud droplets, which are little bitty drops. That right. Have hardly any fault velocity at all. Right. Uh, so the Russians were wrong about that special layer of the big drops. They were certainly wrong as far as northeast Colorado is concerned. That's right. <laughs> that's, where, that, that, that's, where, that's where we were working. That's, that's right. not what was happening up in, uh, what was the name of that little town? Did you go to the... Grover. 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 That's not what was going on about Grover, Colorado. Definitely not. <laughs> Definitely not. That's one of the first things we found out. Was the it, it, northeast Colorado storms. There was no evidence of a big drop zone. And it's not to say there was no evidence of a big drop zone in Russian clouds. So that's what people have been talking about today. A big drop zone meaning a zone where there are big drops. Where there's lots of, lots lots of, super lots cold of water, water and, in, and in large drops. All right, let's see. see though the report from the Russian hail experiment, it showed embryo formation, embryo type very much like the embryo type that we saw in Northeast Colorado. Well, the Russian, the Russian hail suppression technique was based on their, on, on, on their notion of how hail formed in these big, in this, in this big drop zone. Their, 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 their idea was a few of these big drops would freeze, and then be, being in an area with a lot of super cooled water, they would grow very, very fast into, in, into hailstones. Their method of suppression was the use of ground-based rockets. Of, of, they had three different sizes, the largest of which was about eight feet. Well, in Northeast Cotton, we, we were trying to replicate the Russian experiment. But in Northeast Colorado, you cannot be shooting eight-foot rockets. You cannot shoot five-foot rockets. You cannot shoot three-foot rockets because the farmers have aircraft. The, the, one of the main approaches into Denver Airport was right over. So one of the things that had to be developed early on in, in Henry were aircraft rockets, rockets of a certain size fired from aircraft into the parts of the storm. And uh, the first two or three years were used in, maybe the first two years, in developing rockets that could be fired horizontally from aircraft. Safely. Yeah. Where, where Vertical. Yeah. Well, they they didn't. They, they, they were mounted on the door to the aircraft, pointing pointing vertical. Oh, all right. They vertical. had to shoot them Sorry. straight up so as to then fly under the cloud or shoot them straight up into the cloud. Hey, does this prevent hail? Uh, not in northeast Colorado, to a quite a significant extent. Uh, uh, so I'm interested in this, you know, I teach U.S. history and I yeah. hear everybody, every person is talking to me about the Russians. Yeah. How much of this, I'm wondering, and I don't know if you can tell me, how much of this is because the Russians were doing interesting research and it would have been the same had the Swiss or the British done this, and how much of this was just a sense of competition from the Cold War? No, because it's hard to say. when the Russians gave their reports of this, successful suppression of hail in the Caucasus region of Russia. The American uh, set a uh, committee of American scientists 
interested in the, in the atmospheric sciences to Russia to, un, to look at the experiment. And they came back and said that, in effect, that we should try this and see whether it works or not. That was the impetus for the hill. The, for the Northeast Colorado Hail Experiment was the report of several distinguished scientists from the United States who went to Russia. And I dare say that not long before that, the Russians sent a rocket up with a little dog in a space cap. So already we were behind, don't you see? And we're not going to get behind in the oil hail business as well. So when the Russians came to visit NCAR in, what year was that? Oh, it, it, was, it was... The year of the cloud physics conference. It was exactly at the same time as the, as the first moon landing, if, if you remember. What's that, 69? Was it was it sixty nine? I, I don't I can't remember dates where they are. Yeah. Yeah. So so that was that, that was in sixty nine then. But I remember the the grandfather of the Russian experiment saying to uh, to us at Edcar, what crops are you predicting? Wheat. Why do you bother? He said, you have more wheat. When in Russia, there were truck farms and they, there were the the crops being protected were much more valuable crops, which mm -hmm. is true in almost everywhere where they're trying to suppress hail. The crops are more valuable than the northeast Colorado is wheat. Mm -hmm. and so he was surprised that we would even bother trying to stop the hail on wheat fields. Yeah, but back, to the, back to the big drop zone. Uh, Maybe, maybe, maybe we shouldn't go back to the big crops. <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> well, uh, so you said Russian scientists visited NCAR. This is just for a polite visit. Was there any sense that you were cooperating with the Russians? Uh, Was there a sense of... They came for the cloud physics conference, which was held that year in Boulder. Mm -hmm. So, no? All right. I'm sorry, but that... That was in 1976. The, the, the cloud physics conference was held. Well, they they came because they were invited. Mm -hmm. they invited to come. But Charlie, we wanted to meet them and, and, and talk with them and, and get some kind of feeling if they were crooks or not. They basically. And, and, and I, I think we all agreed that, that they, they really believed in, in what they were doing. Hmm. So that was, it was certainly valuable in that respect. Do you, Do you remember that B.J. Mason was there at the same time as the Russians? In the I don't remember that. No, of course you don't. No. B.J. Mason was here. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember going home from that picnic and watching the first moon landing with, with you and Pat Squires on the television set. And that, and that was way before 1976. <laughs> I'm sorry. You, 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 you must remember that, too. The, the, the I remember that. You were all excited. And yeah. we had a picnic for the Russians. It was. At, at Will Kellogg's place. That's right. That's right. That's right. And you played badminton. And you were instructed not to win. <laughs> <laughs> and we went off early to watch the moon landing. The, That's right. The, 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 moon, the, the, first, the first step on the moon. Did you get to watch that with the Russians? Which was a big thrill. No, no, no we didn't go home with the Russians. <laughs> no, they stayed up there. You and missed a moment there, I think. <laughs> yes, yes, possibly so. That's, that's right. The Russians were very nice. Were very nice, you said? Yeah. Very nice people. Hmm. Very nice. And I always remember Shalak Philippe oh, yeah. saying, what? You were spending all this money to stop hail on wheat? When America has so much wheat, you know, and he'll swore as 
where the hail falls is usually a narrow area and, and straight. And the wheat farmers in northeast Colorado know that. They have wheat here. They have uh, nothing here. They have wheat here. And it's impossible to wipe out a wheat crop, by and large, with hail. So Zulak Felice, who was the great Russian hail expert, was just astounded that we would waste the money trying to wipe out hail in the wheat. Yeah, but the question was whether the, whether their hail suppression notion really worked mm -hmm. for us, and, and our conclusion was was quite was fairly quick and quite definite that it, that, it, that, it, that it was not applicable for us. Our method, as I take it, of hail suppression was to fly above the clouds, no, below, no, below, below the clouds, them. release chaff, release what? Uh, no, shoot, 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 so silver right iodide. Ice, ice, ice nucleating agents into the cloud. The, the idea was that if you could freeze the whole supercool, the, the whole big drop zone, then, then, then hail wouldn't form because these ice particles would just bounce off each other. They wouldn't, they wouldn't accumulate. So deny it of the uh, supercooled water. Yeah. yeah. And now you say shoot up. What do you mean shoot up? Did we, were these rockets too? Yes. Or, yes. We're, we're, we're talking about the same rockets. Oh, okay. Small. They, like that. They, 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 they burned a, a, a compound mixed with silver iodide. So, so they, they, would, they would put out a silver iodide smoke as they, as they went up through the cloud. So did this work? It worked in the sense of dispensing silver iodide, <laughs> yes. <laughs> but it didn't, it didn't work in the sense of suppressing hail, as, as far as we can tell. Well, the conclusion of the director of the program was that it, it didn't produce the results the Russians had claimed mm -hmm. in northeast Colorado. Yeah. Also, he suggested that it might reduce the hill, uh, reduce the rainfall. And that's very important, of course. Mm -hmm. So that was the Russian, uh, the Swede, the Swiss tried to repeat the Russian experiment using the rockets from Russia that Russia gave them, and they. Uh, didn't have any better results than we did. So was there a sense that uh, Henry was a disappointment? No. In some quarters, yes. Well, we didn't stop hail, but we'd learned a great deal mm -hmm. about the storms, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and we looked at thousands of hailstones. We learned more about how they form and grow. I don't think we stopped any hail at all. One of the problems with hail suppression, like as, as with rainmaking, except hail suppression is even worse, is that, that you, you never have enough, enough time and enough, enough samples to get a statistically significant result. You can't, uh, obviously, uh, if, if if you can't predict what a cloud is going to do, if you didn't see it, then, then, then you, you, you never know without some kind of a statistical experiment whether, whether your seeding has, has, has had any effect or not. Because it would just be too expensive to go out and chase 2,000 storms. No, chase, chase it would be too limited in time. In order to run an experiment like that, You're too expensive. you would need 10, 15 years, because hail is a rare phenomenon to start with. Yeah. So that's what, because hail is so much rarer than the rainfall, that's what makes it that much worse. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah and it's, it's, it has, it has all, for all kinds of reasons, it's, it's really an intractable statistical problem. One of, one of the reasons is that almost all of the hail damage is done with a very small number of storms. It's the unusual huge storm that, that, that really dominates hail damage and, the, and it 
it's the hail damage that you're trying to get rid of by, by suppressing hail. Mm -hmm. there's, there's, there's no assurance at all that, 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 that suppressing hail for the common very small hailstorm is, 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 is even the same problem as suppressing it for these few big, really damaging storms. So if uh, reading the, so if to me, Henry looks like a big project, what you're saying is it's just barely enough to get started, well, that, statistically, at least well, for hail. Yeah. Well, yeah. we were, weren't we supposed to be five years and did only four? We did only three. By three? Yeah. yeah. 72, 73, and 74. I was there in 75. What, what, what was that? We flew the T-28 in 75 in particular with, with, the, uh, with, with the radar for continuing the research. But it was not a seating year. Mm -hmm. um, it, was, it was supposed to be a five-year seating experiment, and we stopped it after three because, because it was quite clear that the results were not going to be significantly, certainly not significantly positive, mm -hmm. probably not significantly negative either. In general terms, was there a shift from hail suppression research to just hail research, more basic science? Or did the, or did the weather mod continue as an interest? No, it was all basic science, and the weather mod was was just testing that particular part of the equation. But we had good radar, we had aircraft, we had ground crews, we had all sorts of things, so that you could look at the atmospheric science. There was. And, and NCAR insisted on, on supporting a lot of hail research along with the suppression, with, with the suppression test, right from the start. Mm -hmm. But then when they quit the hail, when, 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 when we quit the seeding experiment, uh, the National Science Foundation was talked into, in, in, into supporting the research for, for two more field seasons. It was, it was a small field season in 1975 with the T-28 of the radar, and then a, a really big field season in 1976, which was, which was just pure research with, with no seeding at all. So 76 was our, was our biggest research year, big, biggest research summer. So in the end, you almost got your five years, just in a different yeah. format. Yeah. Not as Henry, but you got a couple more seasons anyway. It was still, I think it was still called ENRI. And yes, ENRI, it was. ENRI means National Hail Research Experiment. Right. So, so there, there's no mention in the title about, about cloud seeding. I see. <laughs> I see. So uh, now you guys keep saying we. Were you out there with these field seasons uh, for, this, for, the, for, the, for, the, for the field work, uh, where the T-28 was going up and the radar station and all of that? We well, was at the radar, and I ran a whole it, most of the years with a, a four or five vehicles to collect hail, to scatter around and collect hail. So uh, that's what I did. I was in the ground. I don't like flying. And the, the T-28 flew out of Cheyenne, I think, for that project. And that's a fair, that's a, that's a fair distance, distance from Grover. Mm -hmm. so, so we only saw the T-28 plane rarely and, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the, the people involved with flying it, but fair, fair, fairly rarely also. You were where the radar was? Yeah. So you were hanging out with uh, Dennis Muscle and those yeah. folks? Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, hanging out with, uh, yeah, I played the horseshoes with Dennis Muscle twice a day. <laughs> <laughs> Is Dennis here? Yeah, I talked oh, to Dennis good. this morning. Oh, great. Oh, yeah. great. Uh-huh. I haven't seen Dennis in years. So there's half the reason why you came to Rapid City, just to yeah. see your old friend. Yeah, sure. Oh, yeah. Sure. Even though you were chasing the stones. and So what were you, you were working with the radar, or? I was working, well, I, Or with the instruments, or? The last director. In 1970, the 1976 field season, I was one of the operations directors. I see. So we, there were, there were, how, how many of us? Me and Brent Foote, was, was, was there one more? Red foot and the eye is customary. Yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's aside from the English language problem. Uh, 
Was it just us two trading off, or was there a third person? A country member. I can't, I can't remember either. But I worked with the T-28 in Oklahoma after that. I think there was a third person. What did you do with the T-28 in Oklahoma? I chased tail. B-28 flew around doing its thing. One day I came back to the field at 5 o'clock or thereabouts, and the T-28 was up busted lying on the field in Oklahoma. So I drove out there in my hail chase vehicle and took a picture the propeller of the T-28 is here and the T rest of the T-28 is over here. <laughs> Colonel Zoom came down a little too fast. Oh. There's a picture which I took, the only picture I took. Are you, are you gonna let me copy this picture, Nancy? I sent the picture to Paul years ago. Oh, you did? She was asked for it. I will ask Paul, for the sake of history. Yes. What? Okay. Um, let me just make a note here. So how long were you all working in these kinds of projects around with these folks in the T-28? Oh, until the last time I was on a project with the T-28. 2000, the, the STEPS program in oh. eastern, eastern Colorado, west, western Kansas. It flew out of Goodland, Kansas, that program. And I, I wasn't, well, once again, I wasn't working with the T-28, I was working with the radar at, the, mm -hmm. at that point. Mm -hmm. I, I was in, into uh, radar, radar studies. A, a big program that Nancy and I both were involved in. The, the, the T-28 was a, was a considerable part of, I think, was this, the, uh, the COPE program in oh, yes. Montana. That's where my hail collector was on the plane. Yeah, I'm interested about this hail collector. Can you tell me about it? This is not just collecting pictures of the hail or oh, shadows no. of no, the hail. The attempt was to collect hail. So tell me about that, if you would, please. Well, it was a small instrument. And they had to, it had dry ice, and they had to open it when they were, went into a possible hail area. And I don't think, well, we never collected it, did we? It was questionable. It would get some ice, but, but you see, it, it, a little door was opened automatically. Yeah. And, and, and whatever came into the door would be trapped in this cooled compartment with, with cool with dry ice. I, th I think we got some ice out of it once. Didn't we? But I'm not sure it was hail. It could, could, could well have been frozen rain. Yeah, I don't think we <laughs> ever got any. Because if any water got in there, it would have been frozen that, by the dry that, ice that, anyway. Yes, yeah, sure. <laughs> but. The, it in, was in, in retrospect, it was not a very exciting idea. <laughs> I, well, excuse me. I, should, should That's I, all right. Go right I, ahead. Should I not say that? Oh, you could say it if you want. <laughs> and you always do. Uh, well, one of the problems was that when the pilot, the T-28 has only the pilot, when he's going into a, he's listening to the radar, he's doing this, he's doing the other thing. And opening a door to collect hail is just one more thing mm -hmm. on a very long list. So uh, the, the few times that it, and the pilots were very good about it, and they would try, because everybody thought it would be nice to catch hail that way, and it would have been. But I think we we couldn't be sure that we ever had. Mm -hmm. But. It's the only attempt that I know of. Has any other method been tried to collect tail in situ? Well, we had a little collector on the sailplane, which 
to it su successfully capture what might be called very very small hail, gravel or more than more than hail. Mm -hmm. That was that was that was that was quite a successful instrument. Oh, yeah. but you must have done that one. No, I didn't. I didn't do that. <laughs> the engineers invented it. I, th I think it was it was our idea. I don't, I don't know. I don't. I don't know whose idea it was actually. I, I didn't have a hand in, in, in either inventing the details of it or in building it. So it's kind of like an improved version of the people who throw their hailstones in the freezer when they fall down to show everybody <laughs> that they're not lying. Yes. Well, <laughs> improved in a way. Yes. <laughs> when I was in South Africa with the hail program throwing hailstone. I went, they had an enormous storm there be, just before I got there in October of 70. I forget what year it was. Anyway, a lot that the people, because they were asked, collected the hailstones. And then I drove around and picked them up all over the area. And I, and there was a report of very large hailstones. And I went out to the farm, to, it's tobacco farm there, and tobacco's a very valuable crop, so the burley is ruined if it's, the leaf is hit by hail, it ruins it. So anyway, I went out and this dear old boa lady came out and I said I'd come to get the hailstones. Oh, she said, the children ate them. <laughs> she, her grandchildren had come and she showed them and they'd eaten. <laughs> so there was one set I didn't get. Uh, let me ask this. So someone had to pay for all these programs. Someone was paying for all these programs. Uh, is NCAR part of the National Science Foundation? I've never understood the money stream for NCAR. NCAR in those days was entirely entirely supported, funded by the National Science Foundation. It, it's it, it, and NCAR is run by UCAR, the, the University Corporation for Atmospheric Research. Yeah. It's a tax it's a tax exempt corporation, non nonprofit corp corporation. So NCAR is independent. NCAR is independent, but we were we were sole source funded by the National Science Foundation. I see. So, so that makes us not, not independent in effect, of course. I see. And UCAR is basically sole function is to run NCAR. It used to be. It's now it's its functions are multiplied. But I see. Uh, in, the, in the days of the National Hail Research Experiment, NCAR was essentially its sole function. When did NCAR and UCAR start? About 1960. What? So 60, you? I said about 1960. Right. So you were there just, just after the beginning. Uh, do you think the National Science Foundation, at least in hindsight, has pursued the right strategy for studying cloud physics and hail and all of that? Yeah, I but, think so. Well, by and large, it's been it's been quite quite uh, quite an, an enlightened strategy, ba basic basic research, try to try to understand the really fundamental the, the fundamentals of how of how nature works. It's getting less so as time goes on. <laughs> less so what? Less fundamental and much, much, much more directly applied. You think that's a healthy change? No, I don't think it's a healthy change. What do you think? <laughs> Nancy, I know you're too shy about your opinion, <laughs> but what do you think? Well, I would like to see more money spent on basic science basic science in the atmospheric field. And I can't do that anymore. And, uh, well, I think it's really misguided. Uh, otherwise, it's, 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 it's exactly analogous to trying to, to, for instance, to trying to find a cure for cancer. The, the, the approach isn't to go and go and test a lot of possible cures. The, 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 the successful approach has to be to understand what causes cancer first. And it's exactly the same with weather modification. It's ridiculous to, 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 to see clouds until you have a, a fairly good understanding of how clouds work naturally. 
Do we have that understanding now? Yeah, it's a matter of judgment what fairly good means. I, I, I think not. You think not? Yeah. You, you wouldn't characterize our understanding of cloud physics as fairly good yet. I'm just getting, I'm just making sure I got you right here. Uh, that's getting a little, a little broader than, than, I, than, I would, than, than I would try to defend. I, I, I think it's not fairly good in the, in the context of applying it to something like cloud seed. So, uh, in hindsight, at least, you think the weather mod attempts were premature? Yeah. That's fair to say. Nancy? Well, I, I think, as much as I know, I think that they're premature. But people with better background than I have think that they're all right. I'm not touching them. <laughs> Shrinking violet here. Yes. <laughs> it's on account of you. On account of me, why? <laughs> it doesn't make any sense, but it's... But I know that a great deal of work has been done on it, and there are a great many good people who feel that it's possible to alter the clouds to prevent hail, to stimulate rain, whatever. Right. To me, as a total outsider, you know, not even in the science field, weather mod has always been such an interesting thing because it seems as if it's been an open question yeah. to some people for a long time, yeah. for 40 years. Oh, yeah. That's a rather oh, yeah. rare thing in science. People are going to ask me, so wait, does this stuff work? And I'll say, <laughs> well, at least the way they were doing it, it didn't work great. <laughs> but it's not just hocus pocus either. That's this right. is not divining rods and uh, you know putting magnets on your head or whatever. Yeah, that's right. That's, that's right. It's a fascinating thing, and uh, some people have the attitude that oh that was just an embarrassing that was hubris, and some people say no there's something going on there but it's not practical or at least we haven't made it practical. <laughs> so I don't know what to tell all my fellow uh, you know humanists. It's a it's a it's a tough one. Uh, I have a hard time answering those questions, too, yeah. for, for exactly the same reasons. Uh, Harry Orville. Yeah. You know Harry Orville. Oh, sure. What, what was Harry Orville standing in the field? Well, he was one of the leading cloud modelers. Uh, cloud cumulus cloud modeling, hail, hailstorm modeling is... Um, Kind of, kind of was in its infancy at, the, at about the time of the start of the hail, National Hail Research Experiment, and it's been developing as as the computers have gotten bigger and people have learned how to do it better. Uh, it's certainly past its infancy now, but to carry the metaphor much farther is a little difficult. Whether it's in adolescence or or past adolescence, I'm, I'm not sure. I tend to think not. Is modeling a major part of uh, cloud physics research? Is it's, it a little? Is it a little side field, or is it? It's a major part now. It, it really is. It, it, it was, as I would say, different people would give you different answers to that question. But I, I'd say at the start of the National Hill Research Experiment, it was it was pretty much a side field, but becoming becoming steadily more important in people's minds. Uh, I've just been reading old documents and things, and it's yeah. it's hard to interpret these documents because I found little documents here. Was Harry more pro weather mod for longer than other people? Do you know what I mean? I know what you mean. I, 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 I'd say probably yes, but but that I'm not I'm not really I, I really don't know for sure. Mm -hmm. I think that Harry has always been interested and knowledgeable and maybe more pro than some. There are some who are very much more pro and there are some who are more anti. And Harry's little 
above the average on pro, I think. Okay. I expect Harry would I expect Harry would tell you that himself, and I, and I would also say that that however Harry answered that question would be, I, I think you could take it to the bank. Okay. <laughs> oh, I'll, I'll ask Harry the same question. Sure you can. Sure. <laughs> You folks were around at the time. Uh, is there someone, is it accurate to say that anyone was, whose idea was the T28 is what I'm trying to say? Was there some individual who was really uh, pushing it or was this an obvious thing to do or was this a consensus thing or, I, I can't get to the bottom of who got this ball rolling with this airplane going into clouds. I'm told it was Paul McCready. Paul McCready, I think. We don't, I don't think either of us know that firsthand. Right. I've always assumed that. Huh? Mm -hmm. And Paul was uh, influential in getting the T-28 yeah. mm -hmm. for the School of Mines. And I always understood that it was, that it was Paul who was pushing it. It certainly makes makes the most sense that way. He was an airplane person, kind of a revolutionary thinker. And a meteorologist. And, and a meteorologist. He was interested in weather modification at the time. So, so it makes... Well, he was down there salting the clouds in New Mexico. It was in Flystaff. Yeah. Yeah. Is, um, is before the T-20. I'd be surprised if it was anybody except Paul. You might ask Paul McGrady. Oh, I'll ask Paul the same question. <laughs> sure. He invited to, he was supposed to come, but he couldn't make it. Everything. Yeah, I have a little money in the budget to go out and fly out to talk to Paul. Good. Oh, good. <laughs> well, you know, one thing I have to do before we're done here, I'm not the greatest photographer. Oh, well, good. And I I've been aiming that, too high. I hope you forgot the film. <laughs> but we have to see that dog. Oh, really? There you go. Now we have a good shot of him. <laughs> I want to thank you both for talking with me today. It's been very well, thank valuable for me. And I appreciate your time. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Well, it was to tell. Good luck with your project. Right? Yes. <laughs> and be sure that we hear about your, your book when it's published or your article. <laughs>